So um, I have uh, some of the texted comments in front of me. So let me start with one of them. Randy, this is uh, directed to you. Right. Could you comment on the Fed minutes released at 1 p.m. today? <laughs> All right. So uh, I was taking a little bit of a look here at these, these minutes to give some uh, real-time commentary. And uh, very much consistent with, uh, uh, with uh, the discussion that I had, uh, had before. Key thing that led them to take the step down was uh, feeling that the labor market recovery had been sustained and would be sustainable. Uh, they are uh, pleased that the housing market continues to, uh, uh, to, to, move, uh, to move forward. And um, they mentioned uh, lower, international, uh, lower international risks, uh, less fiscal, uh, fiscal uncertainty, and so very much along the lines of uh, what we were, uh, we were discussing. There's more of a discussion of the, uh, the concerns about financial stability and asset, uh, asset price disruption. And one of the, that was one of the reasons driving them, I think, to take the steps they did rather than wait and see. There was a cost to waiting and seeing. Uh, that cost is potentially more, uh, more asset, um, asset price dis, uh, disruption. And so they wanted to try to nip some of that in the bud. Certainly, a lot of the, the risk spreads are quite low. They mentioned that in particular junk bond spreads one of the things that I had mentioned, and I think they're going to be looking at those, those quite carefully. And so if you're looking for metrics for what the Fed is focusing on for frothiness in markets, I think uh, junk bond issuance and junk bond spreads would be a key thing to look at. But very much consistent with what we, um, uh, with, with the discussion uh, that I had uh, earlier, uh, the, the market movements have been relatively muted. The, uh, the tenure rate went up three or four basis points. Uh, the stock market was down slightly to begin with and basically hasn't, uh, hasn't moved. And I think this is, as I said, broadly a good thing that the Fed seem, the, the market seems to be focusing much more on the fundamentals than on trying to figure out is the Fed going to taper faster or taper slower. Okay. Um, that also answers to some extent the question, well, the second question I got, which is how much will central bank actions uh, in particular forward guidance shape growth, and I think you've answered that partly. Uh, let me go on to a Fed-related question. What might surprise us under Ye Yellen? Uh, would Austin? Or what, what, what do you guys want to start? Yeah. I don't know. You know, I, I think the challenge facing Janet Yellen, and I think she's, if not singular, she's certainly very well qualified to do it, is that the diplomatic job of moving, what, what has to happen in the Fed is everyone understands the economy is getting better, they have to exit a bunch of things that the getting into them was unprecedented, they don't, nobody knew exactly how they would work and now they've got to unwind them and you've got to both decide as an economist is now the time and how fast should this happen and bring everyone else along and convince them now is the time and here's how fast it should happen. And I think that's a, among the hardest jobs that a Fed chair has had to do as a diplomatic job, perhaps ever, perhaps with the exception of Paul Volcker trying to bring everyone around to those, we have to raise the interest rate to 20% and get rid of inflation and we don't, we don't have any alternative. So I talked to Paul Volcker and he actually said that was easier than this because everybody understood that how, though that was painful, that was what needed to be done. So I think the surprise, if it would be considered a surprise, is that Randy's characterization of Janet is exactly right. Just a very data oriented, very pragmatic economist who's going to be trying to bring everybody along on the FOMC as they do the exit. And that might make her sound a little more hawkish than, than you know, maybe some of her critics say. They think she's a super dove who's going to just try to inflate uh, all the problems away. And I, I, don't, I don't see that as being accurate. But. I would just add quickly that with Janet's ascension to the top chair and Chairman Bernanke's retirement, there are going to be three open seats on the FOMC. So the group of people that are going to be deciding on monetary policy is going to undergo some very important uh, change. And aside from the philosophical aspects of that, I'm sure Randy will agree, what you may not realize is that each governor has some important responsibilities for keeping the operations of the Fed running. And when they are shorthanded, it's very difficult to keep up with all of those. So that's certainly something to watch in the first part of the year. 
Yes, uh, interesting question. In thinking about policy changes or regulations introduced in the years since the crisis, what's your favorite unintended consequence? Well, I would tell you, and I, I'm sure that there are many here who work in the financial markets, I have been hearing reports that the liquidity in some major financial markets has diminished dramatically as a result of uh, regulation making it much harder or, uh, better said, less profitable to be a big dealer bank. Certainly, the extra capital requirements and scrutiny from regulators along with the Volcker Rule has reduced the level of market making. And as a result, in some cases, going back to the May uh, suggestion of taper, the exaggerated response from the 10-year U.S. Treasury was in part uh, blamed on the fact that there weren't wizened heads at some of the dealer banks to take the opposite position and stem uh, the increase in interest rates. So I think that's something we're going to have to be very careful about. Um, uh, go ahead. I think um, one of the other uh, unintended consequences has been because of, uh, well, one part of it has just been risk aversion on the bank's part, but second is um, the significant increase in the, the, uh, uh, the capital requirements. So there's now a very, uh, we've, we've helped to develop a shadow lending sector. So there are a lot of non-banks who are providing lending in the, in the markets. Now that in and of itself is not bad, but uh, we know that sometimes that can be a bit problematic. And so I think that was not the intended consequence. The intent, the intent was to make sure that there's good capital behind lending, and now there are a lot of non-bank lenders who are outside of the regulatory, uh, regulatory uh, framework uh, that are doing this, and hopefully that will not end in tears, but I think that's an important unintended consequence. I think the meta unintended consequence of the poison in Washington has been the change, fundamentally worse change to our, the way we set law, which is every major bill that we've passed in, in the past, um, they adjusted as, you know, the, the second year, they say, oh, well, they, they never meant for this part to be in there, and so they make little adjustments. And that has proven impossible in the current environment. So we're in a very problematic situation in which whether it's healthcare, whether it's Dodd-Frank, whether it's something. With Dodd-Frank, it's a little less so because a lot of things were tasked to the Fed so they can determine the rules. But in things like healthcare, the law says A, B, and C. And you know, th it was never intended that if you were a single mother, but, you're, but your kid was a certain age, you, know, you, you wouldn't qualify for whatever policy. In the old days, they would have just adjusted that, but neither side will will abide. One side says, if we reopen it, we want to repeal it. And the other side says, because they want to repeal it, never reopen anything. And so I think we're going to have more unintended consequences from these major laws maybe than past ones because we can't make those adjustments. Uh, here's a question specific to the U.S. housing market. So what are your prognostications on the U.S. housing market itself? Uh, I think uh, treading water was in Austin's uh, if I yeah, can. look, the, the thing, the, the house price data in the United States, and I assume that they're asking about what's going to happen to house price appreciation. We go through 90 years of about 40 basis points a year of real growth in house prices. Slow, steady asset is what housing is. We then are followed by an eight-year period where house prices grow 12 to 13 percent per year and then collapse. And now we've seen one year in which house prices have gone back up again in double digits. And that's leading some people to say, ah, oh, we're back. You know, housing's going to take us out of this. And I think it's overwhelmingly likely that I wouldn't call it stagnation. I would just call it returning to the normal trend of slow, steady accumulation. Of one, Once we get through the oddities of foreclosure sales and stuff like that, then it's probably going to grow at a slow, steady basis. And I kind of think that's where we are. Yeah, I think that, that is very much consistent with my forecast also. That, I mean, the Fed was you know, so laser focused on making sure that monetary policy was transmitted to, um, to people, to, uh, to, to people who are doing borrowing. So rather than just buy the, mortgage, uh, buy the treasury securities, they made sure to buy the mortgage-backed securities to make sure that the spreads between mortgage rates and treasury rates were brought down. They've really been laser focused on, on that, and I think they've been successful on that. And I think that's dr driven the, the bounce, bounce back up 
But now that uh, rates are, are up around three, uh, the 10-year rate is up around three, it's likely that that's, we're not gonna see the same kind of appreciation. Although I think there's some markets that are still gonna see that, um, and, but those are primarily from uh, uh, international, international demand, perhaps by Russian oligarchs, by uh, uh, some uh, uh, people from China trying to get uh, some of their money out and uh, some others. So that's typically not Chicago, that's gonna be more um, Los Angeles, New York, and a little bit of Miami. So I would just uh, add a couple of thoughts. Those who are bullish on housing will point to a statistic that we call household formation. And the English translation of that is young people who are done with college and don't want to live at home. How many of you have such a young person actually living in your home? Uh, the data show us that there are a lot of those people and those that don't are renting. I still think we're going through a transformation from owning to renting that hasn't finished. And I think sometimes the analysis of housing focuses too much on the interest rate and not enough on the down payment because the new lending standards and the new practices are going back to the days that I remember when we were considering buying property, which is 10% minimum and usually more. And it takes a while to save that up, especially when you're somebody like my 23 or four year old daughter and her budget you know, chart has beer and parties and uh, certainly down payments are not uh, in there uh, as much as they uh, should be. That's what dad's for. Uh, well, uh, <laughs> his beer stash is greatly reduced lately. So, <laughs> anyway, one of the features of the housing market in 2013, which uh, is probably petering out, is investor demand. Uh, and if you took a look at cash flow rents to be derived from owning a lot of properties, it ended up being a very attractive proposition. You're getting the sense that those cash buyers are beginning to diminish in their appetite, and so I would guess for those natural causes that house prices are going to taper off quite a bit in their growth this year. Here's a question which I'll paraphrase a little bit. Uh, what do you think stands out among emerging markets uh, for the coming year? Something. Well, there's dramatic differences across those, those markets. And we saw that in response, uh, the response to uh, Ben's talk about the potential for a step down in asset purchases back in May, June. Um, there are the, as I mentioned, the, the fragile five. Uh, these are uh, large, uh, large emerging markets that have fiscal situations that are not in uh, very good stead, have very large current account deficits and have uh, growth challenges and they were hit very hard and continue to be hit uh, quite hard. And, and so I think we're gonna see um, a differentiation between countries, let's say like uh, Colombia, uh, which has um, low current account deficit, good growth, good natural resources, low, uh, low, fiscal, um, uh, low uh, uh, fiscal challenges uh, that have been growing quite well and had hardly any challenge to countries like India, Brazil, uh, that are having to, to raise rates as the economy is slowing. Uh, they're having to do some uh, fiscal, uh, try to do some fiscal reordering, but have elections coming up, making it very difficult to, to get the fiscal house in order. And I think if you look at emerging markets, first the thing to remember is, on average, emerging markets tend to grow faster than the emerged markets do. So over a long period of time, they're very attractive. But when things go wrong in emerging markets, they go terribly, terribly wrong. And that's kind of the pattern that they follow. A lot of the emerging markets are heavily focused on commodities. And commodities have a real boom bust type of cycle. And there's a lot of pessimism among the commodity producers right now that there's not sufficient growth in world demand, particularly from the relative slowdowns in China and the way that US petroleum product production has ramped up at very low cost and reduced our demand. Um, I think for those guys, it may be a tough, tough 12 to 18 months. Okay, I think we're down to the last question. And this is not about just the year ahead, but the question is looking several years ahead, what is the biggest structural upside and downside to the US economy? Tom, you wanna? Lead that off. I think the structural key to economic achievement here, or in fact elsewhere, is just making sure 
that the fiscal and financial architecture of our country is still conducive to the things that have allowed us to grow so well over the last 30 years. And those are a commitment to working transparent capital markets where investors want to come and invest and capitalists can derive capital that enables them to innovate. And secondly, the open architecture of ideas, education, and uh, the ability to innovate. I get asked a lot, what's going to happen uh, to replace the jobs that have been lost in some cases permanently? And it's a difficult question to ask during the depth of recession because the reality in retrospect is that many of the jobs that ultimately get created are created in industries and by companies that are in their infancy at the moment. And what we must do through our tax policy, through our investment policy, is continue to allow that regeneration to occur so that we can continue to sustain a very solid rate of growth. Look, I'd say that there's, if you look at the data, there's no question what made the U.S. the richest major country in the world is high innovation, ideas translated into new enterprises, entrepreneurship, both within existing companies and, and startups. And that remains our strongest thing, a c cultural and economic commitment to, to those aspects. In a way, that's also the biggest problem facing the economy is that that is going to mean, as it has meant in the past, a lot of dislocation, a lot of disruption. I think the fiscal type stuff in Washington, D.C., yeah, I can be pessimistic, but I don't actually think that's the first order what's good or bad about the economy. Mostly what's most important in the economy has nothing to do with Washington, and it, you know, it, it has to do with these things. And so hopefully we maintain that commitment to education and innovation, but I kind of think that's a central task. Randy, you have the last word. All right, upside is probably uh, the energy sector, the innovation that we've seen here and the ability to, to generate uh, a lot of gas uh, in the, uh, the U.S. has been very, very uh, positive, and a lot of that's been captured in the U.S. It's too hard for that to, to get abroad. And so I think over the next few years, that's, that's a big positive for the U.S., although I think eventually other countries are going to be using similar technologies to, uh, to be able to, uh, to harness these, these types of energies. But this is just a uh, really transformative in all, actually all of North America. You have some changes in the Constitution in Mexico. It's going to allow private sector investment in the energy field. And there's a lot of, of energy that's available in, uh, in Mexico that hasn't been tapped. C uh, Canada has been making large progress. We've made large progress. I think that's a, a structural thing for us, um, positive going forward. Two negative things. One is cyber risk. I think there's an underestimate of the, the potential for a major disruption of financial markets from uh, a cyber attack. I just don't think that we are ready for this. And I think we are, s just think about how dependent we are on iPhones, Blackberries, other kinds of things. And if there's some sort of uh, disruption of that, which I think is certainly possible, uh, how devastating that, uh, that could be because we've s become so used to opening up the laptop to find out what happened uh, at, the, uh, at the Fed meeting while I'm here uh, discussing, uh, uh, discussing this. The other is, um, I think, uh, a tax system that is not focused on growth. Um, we don't, we think about it purely as raising revenues or trying to um, have a battle between different, different interests. Uh, the focus should be primarily on thinking about uh, how we maximize productive investment in the U.S. And so it's a different philosophy, a different approach to the tax system. And I think that's a big impediment that, uh, that we have that we really need to tackle to make sure that we don't get into uh, a secondary stagnation. On that note, I'd like to thank you all for coming. I hope you enjoyed the event. See you next year.